Hi, I'm Kristen Ivey with the Case Foundation, and I'm excited to welcome you to Gear Up for Giving, our month-long um, social media tutorials for nonprofits. Um, we hope you've had an opportunity to check out some of our other Gear Up for Giving resources, like the Click Daily Show and our um, list of resources for some of the most popular social media tools out there. I'm really thrilled with what we have today, which is our first live Ask the Guru session. Um, because it's an opportunity for you to ask your questions about um, social media for nonprofits, whether it's general or specific. We're going to be back here every Tuesday and Thursday for this month um, with great giving gurus. Next week we'll have Katya Andreessen and Stacy Mann from Network for Good. But I want to go ahead and introduce our guru for today, Jeff Livingston. Hi, hey, Kristen. Jeff. How are you? <laughs> Welcome. Um, Jeff is a well-known public re relations strategist and local blogging guru in the DC area. He has worked on behalf of a of worked on behalf of an impressive list of causes and nonprofits. Um, he has published an award-winning book on social media, and earlier this year, he sold his social media boutique to CRT Tanaka. Um, with all of that great experience, I'm sure that I don't have to tell you that I'm excited for him to share some of his time with you today. Um, and if you haven't read Jeff's post on our site earlier this week about bridging between on and offline, I encourage you to do that right after this session, but don't do it now. <laughs> um, I'm going to get to your questions soon, but first I want to ask Jeff to just give us a little bit about his perspective on social media for nonprofits and how you can be using social media effectively. That's great. Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me, and it's sure. great that the Case Foundation is doing this for all the outstanding nonprofits there that uh, want to communicate with their stakeholders and hopefully achieve some good stuff and change the world a little bit. Um, and it's an honor to be the opening act for this. <laughs> um, the first thing I wanted to mention is that as causes we have a unique opportunity to communicate something that people care about. I, I also work for companies and uh, do a lot of uh, social media and innovative stuff on that side as well and uh, for stuff that's as, as exciting as uh, mainframes <laughs> and uh, other technologies and I would just tell you that when we're dealing with things like um, cancer or uh, uh, genocide or the environment. This is stuff that everybody feels in their heart that they deal with on a daily basis. And social media is inherently personal and relational. And so in that sense, we have something that right off the bat people are interested in. Um, and we have an unfair advantage in that sense. So these, these tools represent a great series of ways to outreach, embrace, and communicate with folks and achieve the things that we want to do with our organizations. Great, thanks. Um, I'm going to start with a question that actually was, was from your blog post. Um, and one person wrote, help, <laughs> we're going to be pushing for activity in October to mark, mark the anniversary of the war in Afghanistan. We'll tweet URLs to sign up for an event and we'll put info on our Facebook page, but neither one of those has a huge reach. Do you have other suggestions for things we can do? Yeah, this is actually a great question in a lot of ways because I think it, um, it kind of shows the traditional approach to social media today, which is to say, hey, we're going out on Twitter, we're going out on Facebook, and, and this is what almost every organization does right off the bat. Um, first of all, my question back would be, what about the Afghanistan war are we trying to communicate? And that's not stated clearly, and that's not a social media thing, that's just a, uh, what are we trying to do kind of a thing. So are we trying to uh, support the soldiers? Are we trying to get out of Afghanistan? Or are we trying to stay in Afghanistan? I mean, whatever the organization's goal is, mm -hmm. that should be communicated clearly in every facet. Even in that question, it should be communicated clearly. So uh, making sure that the mission is stated is helpful. Um, I think uh, actually Katya, who's on uh, Tuesday, stated this pretty clearly. If we want to end the Afghanistan war, well, that's a big, huge thing. But if we're trying to do something a little more granular, that's helpful. Um, and so you may want to state what you're trying to achieve at the event, too. Um, now, with Facebook and Twitter and where your community is, everybody assumes that social is Facebook and Twitter. And really what those are, they kind of represent McDonald's of social media. You know, I mean, everybody's out there. Everybody goes and gets a, a cup of coffee, a Big Mac, some fries at McDonald's at some point during the year. 
uh, or maybe even during the week or during the day. As the case may be, your community, particularly folks that are interested in Afghanistan as a serious issue, is likely not on Twitter or Facebook in that sense. I mean, they may use that or use those two tools to communicate with their friends or their networks, but it's more likely that they're participating in uh, uh, Usenet's groups, I mean, I'm, I'm using 1.0 technology here, Usenet's, but uh, Usenet's groups, uh, perhaps uh, Ning groups dedicated to Afghanistan. I, I put a post, uh, uh, a response in the comment section with a bunch of additional blogs that are dedicated specifically to Afghanistan. Find out where these influencers are, find out where the conversation is occurring on Afghanistan, and in particular, find conversations that are sympathetic to your organization's view and engage with these people and bring them in, embrace them, ask them to talk about the event, ask them to come, ask them if they would participate as ambassadors or advisors. Um, I think that's the way to really make that take off. And then definitely use Facebook and Twitter. I mean, again, once the word gets out, people are going to come to those channels to find that information, but it's not the first place they're going to look. Great. I also want to mention we have a great list of questions that people have been sending in to our email, posting on our blog, and through Twitter. Um, but if you still want to contribute a question, we have a chat box um, on the bottom of this video, as well as um, you can tweet your questions in, but make sure you use the, the hashtag pound AGC so that we'll see them and we can pull those from Twitter. And if you want to continue emailing your questions in, that email address is gearup at casefoundation.org. Um, on that note, I'm going to take a question. Let's see, one question that, that uh, was emailed to us, because I do hear this question a lot from people who are concerned about having a limited staff. A lot of nonprofits are pretty lean right now, especially. Um, and so this person has asked, if we had to use one social media site to focus on, what should it be? And what's the biggest bang for a resources buck? Meaning, with our limited staffing, what's the best strategy? Right, uh, it's, a, it's a great question. And again, I, the first instinct is to go to Twitter or Facebook, but that's probably not the right place to go. It, it may be, um, particularly if you're a widespread consumer organization. That being said, I would find uh, an organization or I'd find a site where, in particular, there's a, a deep, ongoing conversation. So let's say you wanted to talk to moms. Would you want to go to blog her instead of uh, uh, Twitter or Facebook? Uh, if there's a, a particular community organization that's dedicated to ending the country's use of oil, like, for example, General Pickens Plan, you may want to be there. Uh, these are the kinds of things that you really need to research and find where your community is having the conversations. And once you identify that top place, if you can only do one thing, do that place well and own it. Make it yours. Great. Um, also from Twitter, I wanted um, to, to ask you this question. Since a lot of nonprofits are still just getting started and experimenting with social media, maybe they've not even signed up for Twitter yet, um, we've had a few people asking, what are a couple of must-dos, the first things we should do um, when trying to switch from 1.0 to 2.0 or even 3.0? That's a great question. I think the, the thing that I see most organizations do <clears throat> is try to treat it like an experiment. So we're going to do that social stuff. <laughs> and uh, when you get kind of uh, treating it like it's like a foreign object almost, like a completely bizarre thing, you kind of start off on the wrong foot. What I would consider is who are your best networkers in the organization? Ask them what they do um, and, and what they engage in, what kind of conversations they have. Because the, the key word is social networking. Um, and the networking part of it never changes. You're just doing it in a different place. I, I kind of look at Twitter like it's an online networking event, you know, or some, sometimes I like it to a high school cafeteria. Um, Facebook is kind of like a Rolodex in a lot of ways with events and things like that. Uh, it just depends on what you want to achieve and what you want to do. But I, I would kind of look at your traditional activities and what you need to achieve and how can you extend that into a social environment and your larger extended family of stakeholders. Great. That's helpful for those people. Um, another another question specifically about Twitter. A lot of people have Twitter questions. I found um, one is: Is Twitter really a proven effective fundraising tool for nonprofit staff um, who are already overworked and 
underpaid, <laughs> um, and who really has time to tweet? How do you make time to tweet? That's a great question. And, it's a couple uh, of questions, actually, I guess. Uh, yeah, it is, actually. And uh, it's interesting because I've been on Twitter for a few years now, and I, I did that philanthropy 2.0 study with uh, another giving guru, Beth uh, Kanner, and, as well as Key Diaz. And uh, um, in that study, we learned uh, what high-dollar donors are looking for. And I would not say that Twitter is the right answer, actually. They're looking for uh, meaningful conversations amongst themselves, in many cases in private social networks. Uh, where they feel safe to engage in discussions about uh, donations, where or not the organization is successful, where or not they're accountable, uh, perhaps they even want to talk to some of the beneficiaries. Uh, Twitter is, uh, again, an important place to be from several standpoints, but at the same time, it's not necessarily the greatest place for, for donations. It is a good place for flash flood events. So it's ironic that we're rolling into Twestival, which mm -hmm. is a gigantic fundraiser using Twitter across many cities throughout the world. And uh, I think you're going to see some significant money raised. Uh, uh, both you and I are participating in DC Twestival. Uh, and That's right. by the way, a little plug for Peter Lamott, who did the local uh, festival, did a great job. Tonight, um, if you're in DC, join us. <laughs> Miriam's Kitchen is the beneficiary. But throughout the world, local organizations like Miriam's Kitchen are going to have tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars raised for them uh, collectively. That's amazing if you can use one social tool to do it. But it, that, that is touching so many thousands of people. Um, again, an individual may be better off focusing on high dollar donors in different places. Great. Okay, we're going to take um, a question from chat, I believe, which is, how do you manage mul multiple social media outlets without having to update all of them one by one? That's a great question. Excuse me, why? <laughs> I think um, there's a, a movement called live streaming. There was a big blogger, his name was Steve Rubell. He decided to trash his blog and go to live streaming. Um, and there are various different tools you can use for that, like Tumblr. But the entire social web is driven off of RSS. And you can use RSS feeds to update different types of social networks. So for example, when my blog publishes, it kicks out a tweet. When I publish a photo on Flickr, it kicks out a tweet. If I wanted to do that with YouTube, I don't publish enough videos to do that. But if I publish a video on YouTube, I could also integrate that into Twitter. I have my Twitter feed integrated into Facebook and my Ning networks. So as a result of that, when I publish in one place, it goes all across the spectrum. Uh, you can use these RSS feeds to make sure that you're just publishing in a couple places and at the same time uh, look on the present. You may also want to keep some social networks separate. So for example, I have uh, some location-based social networks where when I use them, everybody knows where I'm at. And there are other ones where only friends know where I'm at. And uh, we all have to wrestle with that privacy issue in that sense. Mm -hmm. Because when we're engaging in social media for our organizations, um, we're also putting a little personal equity on the line. That's a good point. Um, another thing that you've kind of touched on a little bit, um, you talked about in your post as well as we've, we've kind of skimmed over here, is um, being mindful of your stakeholders and engaging people on their terms. What are some things um, that you consider when you're trying to think about who's my audience and how do I reach them? What questions should nonprofits be asking themselves about their audiences and how to reach them to determine what's best? Right. This is a great question. Uh, and I, I, this is kind of like the ethos behind my entire approach to social media. So I'm going to it may wax a little poetic, and so <laughs> please bear with me if I do. Um, my favorite book on social media is actually Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And the reason why that book matters is because it's about other-centric behavior. And it's so easy when we have our daily lives and we're sitting inside our office or our cubicle stuck trying to get the word out, I have to do this, I spend 50 hours a week doing it. All we do is think about what we're trying to achieve. And then when we get out to the social world, which is basically any kind of a conversational world with where we're trying to build relationships with people, if we just talk about ourselves or talk about what we want or what we need, we're going to turn people off right away. Uh, it's almost like walking into a car dealership. Hey, we've got a good financing deal. You got a clunker? Bring it on it. I mean, that kind of approach always turns people off. So mindfulness is really about almost 
saying, okay, I know what I want to do. What are these people trying to achieve? Why do they care about my cause? What are they talking about as, as related to the cause? For example, cancer, uh, and the reason why I keep bringing that up. Uh, anyway, I have a, a relative that's just successfully finished that, but how do you survive cancer? Uh, how do you support somebody with cancer? Mm -hmm. How do you make them feel like they're going to make it through? How can you support research? Those are the types of questions that they may be asking as opposed to uh, what you want to do, which may be focused on childhood cancer. Uh, so whatever it is, you have to really consider how your stakeholders are thinking about the issue, why they care about it, and engage them on their terms, and then bring them into the larger dialogue. In essence, it's, it's almost like a uh, mindfulness is about humility. It's about going out there and realizing that, hey, we're not the only ones out there that care about this issue. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to take a question from our chat window um, about Facebook. Um, within Facebook, the causes page seems more effective in raising funds, but the fan page seems more effective in generating conversation and reaching individuals. Is there a better way to use Facebook? Before you answer, I do want to mention that um, we will also be announcing some uh, additional sessions that will help you learn how to use Causes effectively since um, Causes is the platform for the next Giving Challenge which will be launching this fall. Um, so we want to make sure that all of your questions about Causes are answered. Um, but would love to get your perspective on Facebook, Causes, pages, groups, all of, all of the ways that that platform can be used and, and what is most effective there. Yeah, there's there's been actually a lot of controversy about causes and whether or not it's effective from a fundraising standpoint. It's definitely a phenomenal branding tool where you see organizations getting millions of people uh, joining a cause, but not necessarily raising a lot of money. And I think there's, a, there's an art to that. And um, I actually should probably tune into your session so I can <laughs> learn it a little better. Uh, but at the same time, it is something that you can use to have people use for their birthdays or mm -hmm. personally go out and fundraise. And uh, one of the things I have noticed with causes is that when people have ambassadors going out there and asking for funds, it works. When okay. it's just the, the nonprofit shooting out messages, can you, can you support us, can you support us, what you have is a lot of fans and not a lot of funds raised. So you really need that personal touch. I guess that makes sense. It's social media. and. Um, Again, you just need your friends to ask right. you rather than to have some monolith. And, and not that your organization's a monolith, but again, it's a brand coming at you versus Krista or right. Jeff. Um, fan pages uh, are a little bit different in the sense that they allow you to drive a lot more traffic to your website. You can use URLs, you can uh, use the fan page to own your own site. I prefer fan pages personally um, because with the Causes app, you don't necessarily have control over how many folks you can email, you can't drive them to your site as easily. Uh, I, my whole feeling on Facebook is it's a great place to engage people that want to be lightly involved with the organization, but not necessarily fully engaged. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you can attract people that want to be fully engaged and bring them through to your website and get them to perhaps donate some funds, uh, $20, $25, $50, and then cultivate them into a bigger donor or a larger volunteer. And I think one thing, I want to highlight one thing that you um, said about causes that, um, you know, it's not always as effective when it's coming from the organization. I think the great thing about causes is that when you are a nonprofit and you have people who are really involved, really supportive, if you want to, you know, ask those people to start a cause for you, then... Um, or, or just let it be known to your network that, that you would love for people to do that, you relinquish some of that control and people can, can use your cause but, but fundraise in their own way for you and it becomes about their relationships, people they know, and it's, it's a whole different kind of fundraising where people are doing it for you because they care about your cause. Absolutely. Word of mouth always works better, right, right. when it's somebody else. <laughs> Um, let's see, what else do we have? Um, one question from email is, what suggestions does the guru have for getting everyone in our organization on the same page in terms of launching social media? We have a small contingent that's ready to go and another contingent that's not as familiar with social media and hasn't bought into the value of it yet. How can we get everyone on the same page and get started? common issue. <laughs> oh my god. Welcome to my Groundhog Day. Um, <laughs> boy, 
boy, that's really, really tough. And the question <laughs> is: Your CEO behind this? If if so, you have a good chance. If if not, you're probably going to have a real, real hard time. And I would just, uh, regardless of whether or not you have your CXO team or not, I would focus on highlighting successes and then making sure that whoever is successful gets put up on a, a pedestal. I mean, let's say this is right. a huge success for the Case Foundation if I was trying to promote social media throughout the Case Foundation, which is not needed, of course. These guys are great. <laughs> we're um, on board. <laughs> they're on board. But I would put Kristen up on a pedestal and say, look what Kristen did. This is great. This is how it impacted our organization. It's amazing. We, this is how it ties back to our mission and what we're trying to do. Um, if you could show that real tangible benefit and return on investment from a time standpoint, uh, I think people want to participate a little more. It's really, really important to work on your uh, C-suite first, uh, the chief executive officer, chief financial officer. HR is really important, actually, so that people get compensated for mm -hmm. spending their time online. Um, the, that seems to be something where everybody feels like, hey, go out and tweet and do Facebook, and by the way, you have to do that on top of everything else that you do. And um, that's not really a fair ask of people. It, to be successful online, you actually have to invest a significant amount of time, and uh, it's not just something you want to add on, even though you could probably get away with it in a recession year. We're not going to be in a recession year very long, and you'll lose your staff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think it's just much more intelligent to focus and prioritize activities where you need it. Great. Uh, we're going to take another question from Twitter from Jack Powers. The question is, isn't social media about restricting access to just your friends and followers? Hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> and my response back is, if that's what you want, that's what you're going to get. Um, if you want to attract people that are interested in your cause, and you're going to talk about that cause in a way that brings them to you and attracts them. Um, it takes time. Social media is organic. You can't just go out there and throw out a nuclear bomb and expect that all this stuff to come up. and catch all this hubris, uh, not that anybody really wants nuclear radi radiation poisoning, but you get my point. You just can't go out there like an ad campaign and have millions of dollars spent and just have attention come at you. You really have to go out there and earn it and make a meaningful impact in the community. But that being said, if you do that, you're going to attract all sorts of people you never expected to talk to. And it, it really the intangible benefits are so amazing. Uh, we always hear about how hard it is and how they're what, 80% of the market has a hard time adapting to social media, but the 20% that does it right just gains incredible benefits from it, and that's what we're trying to achieve. Can you give a couple, of, I, you gave a good example in your blog post about um, one successful approach um, with social media for our cause. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that for people who haven't haven't had a chance to read the post or other examples of campaigns you've been involved with where people were successful? Right. Um, well, the blog post is about a monastery in Vietnam, which was uh, under the threat of getting thrown out and evacuated by the Vietnamese government, which is uh, still communist and doesn't really believe in uh, religion or free religions, if you would. Mm -hmm. And th that particular monastery is... Uh, a Buddhist faith, but in the sense that they embrace all religions. It's kind of a Unitarian Buddhism. Anyway, I don't want to get too stuck into that. Long story short, they've created a Twitter page and a Facebook page and a blog, started publishing content of Save Our Monastery, and it didn't work. Um, and the reason why was because, uh, first of all, they weren't communicating clearly. They didn't involve the, the monk that leads the uh, monastery, who's Thich Nhat Hanh. He's actually a Nobel Peace Prize nominee. Pretty well known. He's mm -hmm. uh, a highly politicized figure. Uh, and they didn't really have great calls to action. And I think it's really about communicating clearly and giving people multiple ways to act. Right. Uh, um, and so we did that. Actually, your suggestion, we created a petition on CARE2, and that seemed to be the thing that got people. I mean, the community wasn't on Facebook. It wasn't on Twitter. It was actually on email, and they wanted just something that they could sign or do. And mm -hmm. they went online, and they joined CARE2, and they signed. It was incredible. Um, it was really amazing to see it happen. And there's 7, it happened quickly, too. Those 7,000 signatures happened in four days, four or five days. It was amazing. Another example is Child Fund. Um, the Christian Children's Fund is another organization I worked with, uh, and we wanted to launch their Twitter account. Very, very low budget. I think they had $5,000 to launch on. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we did was we created two or three things. We designed the campaign so that it would, A, involve 
the children that are the beneficiaries of what this organization does. We try to stay away from the name change from Christian Children's Fund to Child Fund. Uh, it's not that we didn't want to talk about it, but that was what the organization cared about per se. Uh, but people that are involved in the organization want to help children in developing countries. They don't really care. I mean, the, the, the Christian evangelical audience was a little bit disturbed, and we had a couple of disturbances over there where we had to talk to those guys and engage. But really, the branding change was about singleness of purpose and helping children. So when people follow Child Fund on Twitter, mm -hmm. every 200 followers resulted in a gift uh, to Africa, right. uh, for African countries. Um, we didn't get a lot of gifts, per se. We didn't get 20,000 followers. What we did get was organic followers that people really cared about. They opted in. They wanted to make a difference. They wanted to be reported back on. And actually, those reports are going to be coming back this month and next month with photos mm -hmm. and... Uh, 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 some of the goats and things like that. Just different ways that these communities are benefiting from these gifts. And as a result of that, I think the stakeholders that are following Child Fund now are going to say, hey, you know, these I did something, I followed them. These guys reported back, they participated. Mm -hmm. uh, they're in a relationship with me and I want to be more involved with this organization. Mm -hmm. To me, I would rather have 2,000 really strong maniacs online that are going to do anything for my cause than 20,000 right. people that follow me passively. And, and, and that's an example of organic social media as opposed to boosting follower counts for the sake of just having numbers. And I do, that is actually a question uh, we got through email is, how do I get more followers on Twitter? Um, and I think that's, you know, it's a question a lot of people, a lot of people want to know. They want to know that the things that they tweet aren't just going out into nowhere, but that people are actually reading them. So how do yes. you get more followers on Twitter? And take that question. I know you're going to have <laughs> 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 I feel there's a little asterisk on this question. Um, well, but let's, let's handle the question straight on, and then we can, and then we can talk about the ethos of followers, right. if we want. Is that fair? Yes. OK. So if you want great followers, then, uh, and you want to boost your follower count, you have to actually, A, be on Twitter. And that means you actually have to participate on Twitter mm -hmm. and engage in conversations. Um, a lot of organizations like to publish stuff. They like to put out uh, all sorts of things about them. And you know what? I do that as well on Twitter, and I know a lot of organizations that I work with that do that. But the successful people on Twitter do more than just contribute content or ideas. They engage other people in their ideas. In fact, they share other people's ideas. They make heroes. For example, today on Twitter, I thought I was talking too much about myself, and I made sure to highlight three other people that I thought had done great things. And, and it, just to do that on principle, you know, mm -hmm. realizing that it's not about me, it's about the larger community. And so if you want to boost a follower account, that means you have to be a great community member. That means you need to really participate and help your community more than helping yourself. And it's about conversation as well. It's about conversations. And the other thing is, uh, you know, follow people that are interesting and proactively engage them. For example, I, I, I limited my follower count for a long time, and I'm only speaking from my own experience, but I do have 7,000 followers. Uh, um, I thought I had limited my conversation, so I wanted more engaging conversations about the environment, which is my particular cause that I care about the most. And so I followed all these environmental people, and I start seeing great things online now. And I'm able to understand and have better conversations with people as a result of that. It's all about engaging the stakeholders that matter, and they don't have to follow you back. You don't have mm -hmm. to follow you back. One other thing, if you want to increase your follower count, do not, do not use an auto DM because people mm. hate that. People do hate that. I hate that. I hate <laughs> that. I hate that. So, and you, you will see people ranting about that all day long. If you don't know what that is, an, an auto DM, a direct message that um, sometimes when you follow someone, they'll automatically send you a direct message that says, hey, thanks for following me. Check out my website. Um, <laughs> and you know that they didn't type that out just for you. <laughs> they sent it to everyone. So um, direct messaging people is fine and great if you just want to speak to them about something offline, but um, people don't want to feel like they've signed up for your RSS feed in their inbox. So, um, Can we talk about the ethos of follow? <laughs> yes, yes, let's talk about it's that. Bailey Wick. <laughs> now, um, seriously, people that get big follower counts on Twitter mm -hmm. do so because they're doing incredible things. Right. So usually you look at these people that have large follower counts or influencers. I mean, granted, there are some people that are just popular because that's their game is Twitter. 
But for the most part, people that develop large follower accounts run an event, or they're the organizer of TED, uh, or they're involved with the Case Foundation, or you know they're Lance Armstrong and they happen to win seven tours. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or Whatever. They're Shaquille O'Neal. They're the real celebrities. Um, follower count is not a sign of influence. A sign of influence is who's in your network, both on Twitter and off of Twitter. I know some people in this business that may have three or 400 followers, but they know uh-huh. all the right people. And they can pick up the phone and call somebody and get a post put on the Huffington Post. They can get it put on Mashable. They can get it put on all the right places and create a huge splash. Um, so I think effectiveness is about cultivating the right relationships in your life as opposed to having a follower count. Followers follow you if you do the right thing, in my experience. Great. That's it. Um, we're going to take another question from Twitter, or no, sorry, from the live chat. It's um, about professionalism and social media. Uh, is it professional to use social media, or do people kind of look down on it um, in the traditional business, nonprofit world? That's a great question. Uh, and I think more and more professional audiences see social media as something they have to do. But at the same time, they kind of look at it like, um, it kind of reminds me a lot of 1994 or 95 uh, when I was first starting out in my career. I was working at the Electronics uh, Industries Alliance, which was um, comprised of the Consumer Electronics Association, TIA. Anyway, I was the geek that they made progr- hand program websites. And I wrote like newsletters and all this crazy stuff. And I was actually looking at one of these stories uh, that I wrote about this crazy technology called Mosaic. And people looked at me like I was a freak. You know, like, can you do that website stuff? And I'm a PR guy, and I'm teaching IT guys how to use this stuff. Sound familiar? Um, The reality about social is you're still going to get scorned a little bit for a while, but I think we're hitting a point where everybody realizes that they need to do it. Unfortunately, Sometimes you're dealing with a, a plumber that's dealing, all of a sudden has a chainsaw in his hands and goes and you know creates a gigantic mess and destroys the wall, and because uh, it's a different type of tool set, mm-hmm. you can't control the message, you can't uh, arm wrestle people, you can't dictate what the organization's brand is online like you used to be able to, and uh, as a result of that, you'll see some errors, and hopefully people will start respecting social a little more and and being more embraceive of the conversational elements and the relationships that develop here as opposed to uh, just, you know, communicating. Great. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, let's see. Oh, another question from Twitter. Um, are nonprofits using MySpace effectively anymore? Because um, you don't hear people talking about MySpace as much. And if so, how are they, how are they using it? That's great. I actually have a, a major campaign that we're uh, launching with CRT Tanaka in the next month using MySpace as, a, <laughs> as part of the outreach. Uh, I don't want to put something down that's uh, black and white because it's definitely not. But I will say that there are some um, uh, demographic disparities between Facebook and MySpace. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you want to work with people that are probably high school educated, you need to be on MySpace. If you want to work with people that are college educated, uh, you need to be on Facebook. Uh, increasingly, actually, kids are not on Facebook. Or if they are, it's just you know to have those connections. But they're not necessarily playing out there. Their parents are out there. They have helicopter parents sitting on them on Facebook. <laughs> I mean, Facebook's no longer the place to be if you're in college. Uh, You're seeing a lot of people, uh, kids in particular, high school kids, that are out on MySpace. This particular campaign is dealing with MySpace. The other thing is is that the Fox team um, was uh, fired, and they put a new team in place that's leading MySpace. Mm -hmm. And so MySpace is starting to grow again, and it's kind of like the quiet, silent enemy of Facebook that's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I would not dismiss MySpace at all. I think it's really actually a very highly viral network. And in fact, if you Google nonprofits in MySpace, you'll find a page listing all the nonprofit activity going on going on out there. Hmm. And uh, for example, UNICEF did a great video last month, et cetera. So it, it's not something to, to to walk away from. At the same time, MySpace is like a lot of other social networks, which it's kind of like what you do with it. You can publish blog posts, right. you can have videos, you can interact with people, you can build friend pages. I mean, what are you going to use it for? Uh, to me, it's all about finding other people that will talk about you rather than what you're going to do on your particular page. I think that touches on the audience question 
yet again, not to belabor the point, but if you're trying to reach teenagers and they're on MySpace, then you should be on MySpace as well. Once again, where's your community, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, another question from email. My organization's audience is pretty much 45 to 70 year old, 75 year olds who do not use social media. Does that mean so using social media may not be right for me? On the other hand, we would like to develop a younger audience. How do we go about reaching out to them if we don't really have many 21 to 45 year olds on our mailing list? So I guess the question is, if you don't already have relationships with, with that age group that you can email and say, hey, follow us on Twitter or check out our Facebook page. How do you reach these new people? That's great. Uh, do we, okay, let's do the new people first. Sure. New people, 21 to 45. Again, same thing. Find where your community is. Build something meaningful and have a great conversation. Uh, let's say we're using the Facebook analogy again. Don't do a cause. Do a fan page and try to pull back people that are super engaged to your website. And then ask them to email and forward that website to their friends. When they type in those email addresses, guess what? You're getting them. You're capturing their email mm -hmm. addresses. And then all of a sudden you can start engaging people a little more uh, in a more forthright fashion and perhaps uh, having them volunteer, maybe donate, things like that. Uh, asking them if they want newsletters. All sorts of ways to engage them. Great. That's how I would do it. But it's all about getting them back to your website and asking for email addresses and asking them to tell their friends. Uh, and if when they do that, they become a word of mouth ambassador. The 45 to 70 plus. 75, yeah. 45 to 75. You know, my 85 year old grandmother uses social media, so I'm just going to say, I don't <laughs> know if that's always true, but. Uh, um, let's so you might be surprised. They yeah. are on there. Right, they are on there. And I think also that we have to remember that normal people don't think, hey, I'm going to finish my dinner and I'm going to go use some social media for two hours. Right. I mean, they just go online and if they happen to be on a site which allows them to talk or converse with other people, then great. But they're just as likely to surf next to the CNN site. Mm -hmm. And increasingly, 1.0 properties have social function in it. So you can comment on anything or forward it to anybody using social property. So I think it's becoming less about social media and more just about being online. Um, I would look at people that are under 60 as the 45 to 60 is the primary growth segment right now online and social media because we're moving towards the end of consumer adoption. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I would say that they're probably engaged. They're probably just not talking as much. Older uh, demographics tend to be less vociferous and less comfortable in the social environment. They're much more likely to bookmark stuff. They're much more likely to uh, uh, refer to a friend in an email. So provide those options to them and allow them to engage in that way. Uh, Chris Brogan, who is probably the top social media blogger right now, uh, or maybe Jason Falls are kind of having a little back and forth. But Chris Brogan is a master of getting people that are hyper-involved with his site to sign up for email. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great way to engage. And it's also integrating your traditional communications. Again, people don't think about it as social media. They think about it like, boy, I'd like to see that in an email. Or if you actually have a real hard newsletter, can you email that to me? So provide them those opportunities. I mean, however people want to engage, we're game, right? Right. Uh, Above 60 year olds, I, I wouldn't waste my time. I would definitely just use the traditional media this year. I mean, what happens in 2011, 2012, is, or 2010, 2011, 2012 is a different story. All right. Um, I just want to, since we're a little over halfway done, I want to take a break to just say um, a couple of things. One, if you um, have missed the beginning or if you have to drop off, we are recording this session, and so it'll be. Um, It'll be in video form on our site afterwards. And then we're also going to have a transcript of the entire session up um, in a couple of days. So um, if, you, if you have missed something or if you're going to miss something for the rest of the hour, then um, come back and check out um, that recording. And also, um, we hope this is helpful so far. We want to we wanna hear your feedback, though. Yeah, so we have a, a short survey that you can fill out um, on, on the sidebar of your screen. Um, so just, just fill that out and you also, just by filling it out quickly, have an opportunity to win a flip cam and $250 for your cause. So that never hurts. Um, so just those couple of reminders. Um, the flip cams are getting pretty wild. Have you seen them lately? Yeah, they're, they're, they're great. And they're I've industrial. seen some videos too that, you know, say on YouTube, this was produced with a flip cam and they're amazing. 
really high quality. So Anybody can use them, though. That's right. Um, I'm going to take another question from chat, which is, what's a good way to show social media results to my CEO? Um, because, you know, you mentioned earlier it's important to get CEO, CFO, COO buy-in. Um, if, you, if you feel like you have some good results, how do you show those? Right. And a lot of this gets back to giving a financial return on investment. And my question always when we start any effort with any organization is um, what are we trying to achieve? And that's the first thing that the C-suite wants to know. Why am I budgeting this? Why am I letting you spend your time on this? Mm -hmm. uh, so what are we trying to achieve? It, for some organizations that are just experimenting, they really just want to have that follower count. To me, I, I don't see that as a productive use of time, but some executives just want to see how it works out. And that's fine, you know, let them put the toe in the water. But I think what is important is that when you engage with these organizations, when you engage with your executive, you ask what they want to see. So if it's fundraising, how can we create calls to action mm -hmm. which are going to cause people to give money and then measure it from there? I mean, and set a low benchmark. I mean, it's always better to over-succeed and say, hey, we're going to provide yeah, maybe $10,000. Okay, great. We raised fifteen. This is incredible. We have to do more of it. But if you provide a, a, a low benchmark, it gives you some flexibility to maybe mix things up and experiment a little. If it becomes all about hitting the benchmark or fail, uh, you're going to be in a hot water spot. So I think that really is what happens. I'll give an example with Goodwill of Greater Washington, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I did the Fashionista campaign. I got, it's been like three years now. And in that case, they wanted to raise money. and. Understandably, I mean, that's what they wanted to invest their time in. And they've lost a lot of budget. Um, so what we did was we created a blog on Blogger. Uh, they blogged about fashion and using vintage clothes and secondhand clothes, and they featured an outfit from uh, the uh, Goodwill stores locally every single uh, week. Okay. And, and on top of that, they had a runway show, which they did a video of and let people participate with. It just happened to be we had calls to action on the right side of the blog, which included going to the eBay store, which always featured that weekly outfit. We had 8% click-throughs to the store. They loved that. Mm -hmm. and, and on top of it, we got all those intangible benefits, which we referred to earlier in our chat. Lots of media coverage, Washington Post, uh, everything in D.C. we got. But on top of that, MSNBC, CNBC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, uh, it's amazing that still three years later, the same campaign, which still has the same value proposition for the stakeholder, which is uh, uh, young women in their 20s and 30s uh, that are not making a lot of money, it gets 10 thousand reads a month and we're talking a wow. metro area block so uh, again consider that click-through rate I think that's a win great uh, let's see we have another question from live chat do you have any advice for the tiny nonprofits operating mostly on volunteer effort given that social media uh, that using social media successfully is heavily time-consuming yeah. So how do you engage your volunteers? To that, that's a great question. That's a great question. And, and I think that any organization could benefit from that. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you organize your volunteers is really the question. How do you get these people to identify themselves, and how do you get them to congregate? Usually it's a networking event, right? Well, you have to replicate that networking event in some place or form online, whether it's a Facebook group, your own community, which I don't necessarily recommend for a small metro area. Maybe even it's just Twitter and making sure that you're following them and they're following you. Uh, for example, we see that with Miriam's Kitchen, right? Right. Okay. And you want to create ways that these people can embrace what you're doing and make it theirs. So um, we talked a little bit about Facebook causes and birthdays and how people can raise money for your organization. So let's say you have 20 or 30 volunteers that are really hyper engaged, more than the, the other 200 or 300 folks that are just kind of sitting there like, yeah, I do that once a year. Yeah, have those 20 or 30 people, ask them, can you please raise funds for us in, uh, on 9-11 or uh, in November before the holiday season really mm -hmm. kicks in? Can you go out there and raise awareness for us? We would be greatly appreciated. We'll take you to an ambassador dinner or something where they have a, a payoff and we'll highlight you on our website and we're going to do a video with you guys too. You know, embrace them, make them part of the organization um, and give them 
very easy, clear-cut instructions on ways to engage. So if you just ask them to engage, they'll probably say yes, and then they won't do anything. But, I mean, this is what the Obama campaign was mm -hmm. masterful at. Can you give us $20? Can you buy a T-shirt? Can you organize a meetup in your city? Can you, can you do the Facebook Causes app and ask everybody for birthday donations? Right. So if you give them four or five ways to engage, um, they'll do it. They'll choose the one specific that they're most ask. comfortable. Specific asks. Um, okay, another question from chat. Um, about a study that just came out from Pair Analytics um, saying that 40% of tweets are babble. This was a big um, hullabaloo on, on Twitter. Um, does this hurt the value of Twitter and has it affected your use of Twitter? Huh, great question. Um, I've always thought Twitter was babble and <laughs> to a good part and uh, that's just my experience and I actually put up a a blog post today which was the zen of tweeting which was my own evolving use of Twitter after three years um, I think the value of a tweet is just astoundingly uh, over discussed right now hmm. I mean if uh, Ashton Kutcher retweeted something I did today to his 3 million followers I think I may get I don't know 60, 70 click throughs I mean, because nobody really takes the guy very seriously. However, if I have a, a hyper-engaged community member that has maybe 2,000 followers that everybody likes talking to because they're they're there, they're a real person, um, I may get those same 60, 70 click-throughs. Mm. The point is, is that Twitter is what you make of it. And the community that you engage with, if they're putting out junk, then you're going to see junk. I, I'm really very judicious about who I follow and who I don't follow. I really want to see quality tweets from people in general or I want to have a personal relationship with them so that they can DM me if they need to. Otherwise, I don't follow them. Um, and again, I don't take Twitter to be uh, the end-all be-all. I look at it kind of like a high school cafeteria where everybody kind of gets together and they say, hey, after school we're going to do this. And then after school is where the meaningful stuff happens. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, it just happens to be that we're all in the cafeteria together right now. Great. And uh, another follow-up question, um, where do you think social media, so Twitter included, but, but not necessarily Twitter, where do you think social media will be a year from now? That's great. I think this is your answer. This is my iPhone. <laughs> I am not saying uh, that the iPhone is the end-all, be-all platform, because we all know that there are a lot of Blackberries out there in the marketplace. I have a Blackberry. <laughs> and uh, actually a lot more than the iPhone. Uh, you have Google starting to enter the marketplace with its Android mm -hmm. operating system. I think Sprint is really relying on Android to save its neck, so to speak. And I hope I didn't offend anybody from Sprint. Uh, Nokia is the world leader in mobile phones, and they use the Symbian platform. Uh, so there are all these different operating systems which create kind of difficulties for organizations that are trying to communicate using uh, mobile. Because you can't create an application for an iPhone and then just port it over to the BlackBerry. You have to basically create a brand new application for the BlackBerry. It's completely different software code. So in that sense, the technology creates problems. The other issue is that most people don't have smartphones, so to speak, phones that are capable of real broadband internet access. And in that sense, uh, we're still dealing with an early adoption phase. That being said, more and more people are accessing the internet using these mobile phones. I think Facebook had 70 million people access the network using mobile phones last month. Um, if you consider global uses of computing devices, it's happening here and not on computers. These people in general cannot afford to buy a $2,000 MacBook Pro. They can't afford to buy a $200 subsidized iPhone or they can buy a netbook. Um, and they're accessing the netbook on mobile networks. So I think mobility is really where it's at and that's where we're heading. My, my best recommendation for using a mobile social network right now would be try playing with Foursquare, which is uh, in development, but it's highly uh, engaging. It's a lot of fun. It lets you travel throughout the United States, and uh, it provides a lot of word of mouth referrals for great places to go eat, go to a club, go get coffee, go sightsee, whatever it may be. Do you know if Foursquare is going to be available for BlackBerry? Have it you, is already. It is? It is. Yeah, yes, it is. Oh, yes, I did not is. know I that. I checked out their site just yesterday. Okay, yeah. because for a while it wasn't, right? For a while it was iPhone only, I but they're developing it. I was always jealous of people who are 
Yeah. On Foursquare. Yeah, and I'll check that out. <laughs> and it's interesting because they're doing things that Bright Kite and Looped and uh, Gypsy have been trying to do for years, but for some reason these guys just have that secret sauce that, that that's working. I mean, it's kind of like the iPod. You know, everybody was trying to make these music players right. for years, but then once Apple did the iPod, it was over. Uh, I think that's what's happening with Foursquare right now. Okay. Um, I'm going to take one more question from email, I think, and then and then we'll probably have to wrap up. Um, the last question is, how does an organization assess whether to start using social media tools for program publicity and general marketing that's not necessarily related to an actual fundraising event? You can't necessarily always be doing a fundraising event, so yeah. how should you be using it in the meantime? I would actually... I would actually flip that equation and say instead of using a fundraising event to start engaging in social media, start engaging before you're involved in a fundraising event so you can build community. Uh, let's get back to uh, discussing relationships and the way equity works in relationships. In any relationship, I don't care what kind it is, there's pro quo, right? There's give and get, and everybody puts in and, and invests basically in the relationship. So when your very first touch with somebody is asking for money or asking people to do things, you have to work a lot harder to get that give, so mm -hmm. to speak. You really have to compel people to open their wallets. However, if you build a relationship where you're actually having meaningful conversations talking about what these people care about, right. and you do that for a substantial period of time where people really enjoy and care about the organization, and then you have a campaign, it's much more likely that that campaign is going to be successful because you have equity already invested and people care about you and feel a part of the organization. And that's, you know, I think what we're trying to do at the Case Foundation with this Gear Up for Giving program. Um, we are going to be having another giving challenge this fall. Um, uh, Awesome. Similar that to was awesome. <laughs> similar to the giving challenge we had um, about a year and a half ago or so, um, which you can read a little bit about what happened in the last giving challenge and um, what the success stories were and how much money was raised online um, on our website, casefoundation.org. Um, but but that's really our hope with with this is that um, you can be you know using the resources we have on on the site and playing with social media, beginning to reach out to your networks, and in the meantime, the Giving Gurus will be here every Tuesday and Thursday so that you can ask your questions as more questions come up as you go along. Um, and then by the time the Giving Challenge starts, you've already been engaging with your networks and um, and hopefully you're, you're using it more smartly <laughs> than, than when we started. So um, that's that's the purpose of, of our Gear Up for Giving this, this month. That's great. It's awesome that the Case Foundation is doing it. And I have to give you, my friend Kristen, <laughs> a hand because uh, Kristen's been Thank organizing you. this. She's put together all the giving gurus for you, and uh, she's going to be your hostess throughout the month. So uh, what an amazing job that Kristen and the entire Case Foundation has done. Uh, it's an honor to be the, the opening act. And thank you so much <laughs> thank for having you. me. I actually have not done this by myself at all. Um, Carrie Saratovsky, our social citizen, is going to be um, doing some of the moderation of some of the gurus, um, yeah. depending on what was most geographically convenient. Um, and and we've definitely had a lot of help from the team. So thank you for that. Um, and let's see, just a few notes to wrap up. Um, I want to remind you again to quickly fill out the survey. It'll only take a couple of seconds, um, short questions, to let us know how we're doing and how we can improve these as we go along. Um, so it's, it's also an opportunity to win a flip cam and to get $250 for your cause. Um, we will be back here every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, next week we have Katya Andreessen and Stacy Mann from Network for Good. That will be at 1 p.m. Eastern on, um, on Tuesday. And again, we'll have additional sessions that have not yet been announced about causes on Facebook and how you can really learn how to use cause as well because they have a lot of tools on there. The birthday cause, which we talked about, but a lot of helpful things to um, help you to reach out to your supporters in different ways and to raise funds. So we want to make sure that 
you're totally familiar with the Causes platform before the Giving Challenge. So we'll have more of those sessions announced, so check back on our website for those, casefoundation.org. Um, and if you missed anything earlier today, we will have this session taped and we'll have the transcript available <laughs> online so you can watch it over and over. <laughs> Um, and I think that's everything. Um, thanks, Jeff. If you have any final thoughts you want to share, then um, we have a couple more minutes. Um, do you have anything? Final I, thoughts? I just want to say that if anybody's interested, uh, I'm going to be doing some uh, significant pro bono activity for Live Earth and the environment. And if that's something you care about, uh, please stay tuned to at Live Earth mm -hmm. on Twitter. And uh, we're going to be doing some r really fun stuff next week. And tell everyone your website, how they can find you on Twitter and, and all of that stuff. My handle on Twitter is Jeff Living, and it's spelled G-E-O-F-F, -F, Living. And uh, my personal website's jefflivingston.com, and my blog is livingstonbuzz.com. Great. Thank you so much for um, being our first giving guru, and um, thank you everyone for sending in your questions. Um, Great please questions. Keep, if we didn't get to your question today, um, we will save those, but please keep sending them to gearup at casefoundation.org, tweet them at uh, pound AGC, and we'll continue pulling those. And, um, we hope to get through everyone's questions throughout the month with these Giving Guru sessions every Tuesday and Thursday at 1. Thanks again. Thanks.